peace and hope. Therefore, since we, we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, so we, have, we have begun a, a sort of sermon series on the resilient church. Do you remember, and, and, and anybody here from last week? Most of you, great. So you will have heard Rob kind of kick us off talking about, uh, what did he talk about? Uh, focusing our eyes on Jesus, that was it, Rob. Uh, it's burnt into my memory. Um, <coughs> this week I have been given the wonderful theme on the power of hope. So just before we start, let's just kind of pause together uh, and let's invite the Holy Spirit and let's just be still. So let me just even invite you just to be in a moment of silence, just to kind of put aside the things of the week, maybe even of the day. Just hand over these things that have worried you, maybe even the things that brought you joy, and whatever they are, just hand them over to Jesus now and say, Lord, I, I want to make space for you. Lord, we thank you that though you are God of all things, the universe, time, history, you are here in this room and each person you look at full in the face and say, I'm here to meet with you. So Lord, we just pray for your spirit. Speak, Lord, because your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On December 17, 1927, a U.S. Navy submarine was mistakenly hit by another one of its own ships. And it was hulled in the starboard side and it sank to over 110 feet of water. Tragically, 34 out of 40 men died immediately. But six men were trapped in the torpedo room in the front of this submarine and in kind of tangled wreckage and freezing water u.s navy divers frantically tried to save these six men and on one of the dives one of the actual u.s navy divers thought he heard something coming out of the submarine and, and so he put his kind of helmeted head up against the side of the submarine and he realized that somebody from inside was was doing a was actually sending out a question in the dots and dashes of Morse code and they were sending it out over and over and over again and as he listened he slowly decoded what was coming through and it was this question is there any hope and this frantic and despairing sailor was asking a question that many people in many situations and some of us maybe in here today is asking a question is there any hope and you know people have always asked this question throughout the extra centuries I think in this country you know people are asking this with greater urgency than ever before you know, the, the optimism and the complacency of the 1990s and the early 2000s has well and truly disappeared. And I'm not the only one to sort of say that as we look back. In this country, over the sort of past few years, we have faced a political crisis that tore this country in two, followed by a pandemic that killed tens of thousands and pushed our economy and our health service to the very brink. We are facing 
war in Europe that we haven't seen for 70 years, the type of inflation we haven't seen for 50 years. The Bank of England estimates as it looks forward the longest recession coming up in living memory. Despite the government help that is coming, we know this winter in this country people are going to be choosing between eating and heating. And the backdrop, the ticking time bomb in the backdrop is of climate change. You know, we've just had the hottest summer in Europe. We have just read recently, have we not, that we have passed five of these tipping points. That means that the climate change is irreversible, at least some parts of it are. And our young people are feeling this rising tide of hopelessness more than anybody else. There's a massive pandemic, um, hidden pandemic of mental health amongst our young people. Uh, globally, one in seven 10 to 19 year olds are suffering some kind of mental disorder. And to cap it all off, today of course is our official day of mourning you know, for a monarch who has spanned so many years, the death of a monarch who similar strength and continuity for many, it's the end of an era. Is there any hope? And you know, people are right to ask about hope. Because hope is completely fundamental to human existence. You know, without hope, the very act of living seems insurmountable. But with hope, we can overcome extraordinary obstacles. You know, the uh, at just over 18 months old Helen Keller suddenly lost her sight and her, and her hearing. She was suddenly kind of plunged into a tomb of silence and darkness. And, and she faced remarkable obstacles. And yet she grew up to be a powerful advocate for disability rights and women's rights. She was the first women to, first person, first deaf blind person to achieve a bachelor's degree. She wrote 14 books. She taught the whole world talking about disability rights. And somebody once asked her, how do you do all your achievements? And she said this, she said, nothing can be done without hope. With hope, we can overcome extraordinary obstacles. No wonder people are desperate for it and seeking for it, wondering if it really exists. Is there any hope? And yet here is the answer. There is hope. As Christians, we have hope. Alongside faith and love, it's the foundation, it's the building block of everything we encounter with God. It's a massive theme in our Bibles. Paul uses this word hope 46 times, 129 times throughout our Bibles. It talks about hope. The answer to the question of the sort of, you know, despairing sailor is, yes, there is hope. In Christ and in Christ alone, we have hope. And so what... What is hope and what's the power of, of, of hope? And for, for the rest of our time together, let's just explore why hope really has power. Why it has power for you, whatever you face in your life. You, you, I know the, the, the story of Noah is a really crazy tale. If it, we're so familiar with it, we forget how crazy it is. It's a story of a crazy man with a crazy faith that he built a crazy boat and the crazy animals show up and they get into this crazy boat and this horrendous sort of uh, you know, massive sort of rainfall falls and most of, him, most of humanity is wiped out. It's a crazy tale. But the craziest part of this tale is right at the end because if you read it, then you realize as you read it that God almost regrets what he's done. As you read it, he's almost sorry for what's occurred. He promises to never do it again. And this is crazy because God is God. God can't re regret anything. The whole language of regret is absurd. What is going on in this tale? And in this tale, God is telling us that destruction is not part of the plan. You know, however dire things get, and they were dire then and they're dire now, whatever the world deserves, God is saying fundamentally, do you know what, I'm not into that. And from the rest of the, the sort of Bible onwards, he starts to sort of tell us what he is into. And as we build up that picture, we start to realize what he is into is making things new again. And, and at last, last um, Christmas, I, in to one of my talks, I, I told you that I'd been profoundly moved by watching the, the film, The, the uh, Passion of Christ. 
And, and if you remember, if you were there, it's quite an old film now, but I, I said to you that um, I felt this whole film hinged on one scene, one phrase even, and the whole film had been working up to that film. In fact, all of humankind had been working up to this one phrase in this film. And, and this film was uh, really based on the Gospels. It was really historically accurate, but if you read it and you see this film, you realize Jesus never said this, this phrase that he uttered in this film. He didn't say it, it's historically inaccurate. And yet, of course, as you know, he did say it, just not in the Gospels. He said it in Revelation 25, um, 21, 5. He said it from heaven, as the world as we know it is coming to an end. Um, and if you've seen this, this film, you'll know what this phrase is. It, it comes as Jesus has been beaten to within an inch of his life. And the whole project, the whole kingdom of heaven and earth, looks utterly lost and doomed. All his friends have abandoned him. All hope is gone. And he encounters his mother as he staggers along the streets of Jerusalem. And he sees it with blood pouring down his face and tears pouring down hers. And he grabs her face with his hand and he looks her in the eye. He says, Mother, behold, I am making all things new again. And this is the story of hope, my friends. This is what it's all about. What underpins our hope is that God is going to make it all new again. The whole myth of progress is just a myth. Stuff ain't going to get better by itself. And, and, and we're not just passing through. It's not just closing our eyes to the horror of it all, hoping it all goes away. That's not the way of hope. The way of hope is new creation. And the beauty of it, the beauty of it, is that it isn't just waiting for something beyond the horizon. It breaks into the present now. It's not total as we well know, but it has begun now. And that is why if you follow Jesus in the sort of first century and listen to him, he said, the kingdom of heaven has come now. Blind people will see now. Lame, lame people will, will walk now. Those who are bound up in prisons of, of, of sort of emotional and spiritual captivity will be free now, he says. He said, we have an inheritance waiting for us in the future. We have a down payment for us. Now, and this is true for our lives today. For some of us, our bodies might seem battered and tired. Our relationships fraught and fractured. Our ministries weak and struggling. But Jesus would stand before you now and says, Behold, my friends, don't use hope. I am making all things new again. When all seems hopeless, Hold on, because I am making all things new again. And therefore we can say this about hope. Hope is a vision for the future that impacts the present. Hope is a vision for the future that impacts our present. This word hope in our Bibles is from the Greek word elpis, and, and it means a, a desire of some good with an expectation of, of obtaining it. And when the ancient Greeks used this word, they, they, they uh, used it in the way that we often use hope now, as a sort of wishful thinking of something that will come. But biblical hope is nothing <coughs> like that. It's not about wishful thinking. It's, it's about a vision for the future that impacts our present. It's about something that happened in the past, that the um, resurrection of Jesus, that points to something that happens in the future, the return of Christ, which impacts us in the present in our moment now. This triple kind of perspective is, is what underpins hope, is what hope is all about. And last week, uh, Rob spoke about the intentional actions that build resilience. And, and the intentional actions that underpin hope are all about two P words. They're about perspective and they are about perseverance. And, and, and I won't say hardly anything about perseverance because that's going to come up in, in our um, series. But in our passage today, Paul says that perseverance builds character and character ends up building hope. The more you persevere, the more hope you get. Perseverance is the wellspring of hope. It's about perseverance. It's also about perspective. Perspective is about what you fix your eyes upon, what you allow to fill the windscreen of your life. 
Is it about the problems of the moment or is it about the glory of the, the uh, future? This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. This is a guy whose body was battered and torn. He was thrown into prison. He was, he was cast aside. His whole, if you looked at what was happening around him, it looked hopeless. This is what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, he says, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, it's all going away ultimately, but what, we, what is unseen is it eternal. The intentional actions that underpin hope are perseverance and perspective. Keep on hanging on. Fill your windscreen with the images of hope. We can trust in Jesus for the present. We are sustained in the, the, the present. Because of our hope, whatever befalls us, whatever happens to us. But there was once a guy called Michael Sattler. If you've never heard of him before, I hope after today he will become one of your heroes. He was an Anabaptist. The Anabaptists were a group of people who believed in such basic things as, as baptism in response to faith and not as a child. They believed in personal discipleship. They believed the church should be separated from the state. And because of these fairly uncontroversial beliefs as we see them now these people were persecuted and tortured and killed and Michael Sattler became one of their uh, leaders and in May 1527 he was arrested together with his wife and a few other people and and he was imprisoned he was eventually tried he gave a clear testimony of his faith but they mocked him in this trial and they sentenced him to death death by burning and as he was sent out on this cart to his death, a piece of his tongue was cut out. And six times en route to the fire, red hot tongues ripped pieces of his flesh out from his body. He was tied to a ladder and he was thrown onto a massive flame, massive fire. The night before his death, he knew what was going to happen to him. And do you know what, what uh, worried him most? What he prayed for, he didn't pray for his deliverance. He worried that all the secret Anabaptists in the crowd would watch him suffer. And his suffering would be so unbearable that they would lose hope and be deterred from following Christ in the way that they felt he was asking them to. And so do you know what he prayed? He prayed that he would bear it. And not only would he bear it, he would be seen to bear it. And, and so... Uh, when he was thrown into the midst of this great fire, as the flames burnt the ropes that held his arms to the um, um, ladder, in the midst of the smoke and the noise and the flames, the massive crowd standing watching out of all this, a fist came out of this fire. And everyone watching knew what this fist meant. It meant that what he was going through was bearable. It meant that he was not overwhelmed. It meant that in all things, we still have hope. And this clenched fist greatly encouraged his wife, who was watching, who days later was sentenced to drowning in a river. And she was given multiple opportunities to recant her faith, and she didn't do it. This fist. The story of the fist went across Europe. It encouraged thousands of others who were facing persecution and death and martyrdom. This message then and is now is that amongst whatever happens to us in life, whatever befalls us, whatever happens, we still have hope. And this message is kind of echoed down the centuries. How was it that those first disciples, those apostles, could all give up their lives, apart from the apostle John as we know? How was it that, that the Christians in the second and third centuries could, could uh, endure being torn apart, um, torn apart by wild animals in the Colosseum and set a, set a light as human torches to light up Rome? 
How can the struggling Christian communities in India today face persecution from militant um, Hindus? How can the Christian community in Sri Lanka recover? 2019, if you remember, scores of them bombed in their churches. Hundreds of um, families ripped apart. How can the Christian communities in northern Nigeria face having their children kidnapped and harassed and persecuted by Boko Haram? How can the six, nearly 6,000 people who were killed last year alone because of their Christian faith, how can their families and communities cope? How can those of us who face unemployment and terminal illness and family breakup, how can we cope? The answer to this is because we have hope. Because we have hope. And let this be a sign to you this morning. Whatever befalls you, whatever is befalling you, now and in the future, you can live in hope. Because of what Jesus did in the past, we have hope for the future, which generates faith for the moment. We are sustained in the present because of our hope for the future. We can trust in Jesus our Lord, our Savior, our friend, who is with us now. The events of our lives can never overwhelm the hope we have and the hope that we live in. Let's just pray together as we end. Lord, we thank you for this remarkable truth. Because of what Jesus did, and because he's coming again, that our lives in the moment have worth. They have meaning. They have hope despite the events of our lives. Lord, I pray for those in the room today who maybe they've never mentioned this to anybody, but they are on the verge of giving up hope. Maybe it's an event of your life, maybe it's the accumulation of many small things and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm about to give up. Lord, I pray for those people. I pray that they will hear this. I pray, Lord, for the gift of perseverance and the discipline of perspective. I pray that they will know you with them in this moment. I pray that they will reflect on the clenched fist from the fire. That whatever is going on in our lives, we can hope in you. Not just for some ambiguous future but for the present of our lives. Lord, we worship you. We fall before you. And just even as we go through the, um, the rest of our service, and we're obviously going to do communion, which is a living sign of the hope that we have. I'm, I'm one or two others. I will be standing at the back. If you want particular prayer, if that is you, if you or somebody you know and love is on the edge of giving up hope, let's pray for you. Don't lose this opportunity for that. So we'll be at the back um, at different parts of our service. Please come and find us and we'll pray for you. But I bless you.